Welcome back to Breaking Monero. This is our ninth episode on poisoned outputs or the EAE attack or NAC attack. It's given several names and we are here to discuss this pretty honestly difficult and nuanced topic to talk about. So we'll do our very best. We're here with, with me, Justin. We're here with Surrey and Sarang. It's great to have everyone here on. So um, this is a, this video is going to be diagram heavy. So if you're watching this on like a podcast, we'd recommend watching in video form later if you're confused because there's really a lot of stuff going on. Um, but first we're gonna have Surrey talk about like, what's the general idea of sort of marked funds that we're sort of talking about? And then I can jump into the diagrams to explain the situation to you all. All right, so here is a thought experiment for everybody in the Breaking Monero audience. Let's say that you are uh, living in an oppressive society and you want to buy some banned books. Um, and let's say that you have a local banned book dealer who stands on the corner and you can go give them cash and they will give you uh, your Bible or your To Kill a Mockingbird or whatever copy of uh, banned textbook that, uh, that you want. Um, now, one question you might have is how would this tyrannical government come to the conclusion that you are a purchaser of, of these uh, devices? Or uh, rather, um, how would they go about tracking the person who is supplying all of these banned books, uh, these nasty little devices to society? Well, one way to do it, and this is how law enforcement has done this, you know, this is like good old fashioned police work going back hundreds of years. You'd go do a controlled purchase from one of the street dealers. Uh, you go buy a book six or seven times in a row, uh, and then you look for bank deposits at local banks. Um, and what will end up happening is this street dealer will go give the cash to his boss or one of his boss's minions who will then hand it over to the boss. And then eventually it'll make its way into a deposit at a bank account. And if those dollar bills that were used to purchase the banned books were marked, the bank will alert law enforcement and uh, they will have found their kingpin boss who is depositing money um, from these controlled purchases. Um, so the essential idea is person A um, is purchasing, excuse me, person E is purchasing something for, uh, from, uh, oh man, I screwed it up. So the main thing is, is that somebody is buying a book uh, and there's gonna be a chain of custody of the money that will eventually in, end up in some know your customer bank's hands. And once that money ends up in the bank's hands, they can start linking real life identities with those original purchases and find the interior hops of those transactions. And unfortunately, this is a problem that Monero faces. Uh, I'll hand this back to Justin. Excellent. So we're going to take a look at this attack in a little bit more detail just to show people what it is. Now, again, a warning, this is this is very um, this is a very heavy series of slides, so sort of brace for impact here. And I'm going to try and get my cursor up here, laser pointer, perfect. So as discussed, you have person Eve that is sending funds to a specific address. The, the address with Monero, 4-3, whatever, whatever, it goes on forever. And um, they're learning information when this person then takes funds and puts it on an exchange or some other colluding entity. All, it doesn't matter what these entities are. All that matters is that Eve is colluding with the exchange or this party A is colluding with party B. Again, it doesn't matter who these parties specifically are. So let's say Eve sent a transaction um, to that address. They create a ring signature as shown here. They use their real output here that's related to Eve. <clears throat> And then they create a transaction with two outputs. One output is given to that address. We'll call it output A. And the other address, let's say, is given back to Eve. So Eve doesn't worry about this. She's not trying to track this output. Um, ultimately, let's say that Eve comes back, looks at the blockchain, and notices that there are three transactions that have this output in their ring signature. These are not associated by time or anything. Let's just say there are three transactions. <clears throat> and let's say like this first one, um, again, it uses A, the second one uses A. They, they all use this one output. These are all the transactions on the Monero blockchain that use this output. 
And we're not sure necessarily that A is, is truly spent in these ring signatures. It could be a decoy in all three, but the, they're still trying to learn information about what the situation is. So let's say for the second transaction here, for instance, that um, someone deposited this output on an exchange. This, this one yellow output here was sent to an exchange and Alice was the person who sent the funds to the exchange. So for this EAE -E example, you have Eve as the first E, you have Alice in the middle, and then you have the exchange on the last portion here. So um, what we have to note here is like the exchange might suspect uh, with in conjunction with Eve that Alice is the holder of this Monero address. Now, this is a heuristic. It's not very strong, especially if there's only one instance here. We don't really know what the, what the real case here is, right? Um, it could be that um, Alice just used this output in the sort of ring, uh, use this output as a decoy in the ring. And if this only happens once, it, there's a pretty high chance that this, the uh, high probability that this just happened by chance, that Alice is not the true person who holds this, this um, address. But if this happens twice or three times or four times, well, now you're starting to get a pattern where Eve sends multiple transactions to this address. And then this address has several deposits onto the exchange all under Alice's account. Well, now the exchange and Eve are starting to learn a lot of information where they can say, okay, the chance that one person that deposits funds on our exchange is able to have a possible really recent spend from the outputs we assign to this address is very low. It's a very, very low probability that this happens by chance. And so as a result, we're going to assume that there's a good, a good enough amount of evidence that Alice is the same person as this address. And it's not the only sort of circumstance that can happen. Um, this, this graph gets very messy, especially as you add other sort of situations. We're trying to really keep it simple for this episode while nevertheless keeping, at least discussing some things that can sort of get in the way. So let's say for this ring here, that there is another output that was sent to the exchange as I'm, as I'm highlighting here. <clears throat> well, in this case, um, maybe this was sent um, to Charlie who sent the funds to the exchange. Well, the exchange probably would at least have some suspicion of Charlie, but it's far more likely that in Charlie's case, it happened by chance than in Alice's case had it happened by chance. But it's certainly some limitation of this sort of model. Um, and th th it's a very sort of complex system on how these things get added. Um, ultimately, it is a statistical test to say, okay, what is the likelihood that this would have happened by chance? Or what, what is the likelihood that this is actually what's going on? And you're going to have type one and type two error as you conduct these statistical tests. But ultimately, there are certainly ways for them to be much stronger in some circumstances than other circumstances. Do you mind if I jump in really quick, Justin? Um, yeah, sure, go ahead. One thing I wanna point out is just to connect this graph to uh, this discussion I, I, I mentioned a bit, little bit ago about controlled purchases. Um, one way that you can visualize this is um, Eve is, for example, a, a detective who's purchasing banned books online. Um, they've uh, constructed these four purchases uh, from this, this uh, anonymous online vendor, 43WI. Um, and then a couple of months later, or maybe a week later, um, this exchange notices that Alice makes all four of these deposits. Uh, the exchange comes to the conclusion that these four deposits are probably related to uh, those uh, the banned bookseller purchases. Um, the difference is, is that in Monero, we have these ring signatures that point back to several previous spenders. And so in the cash scenario, I have this linear chain of money going from one person to another person. Here, we have uh, each output is used uh, possibly in multiple ring signatures uh, and is only like probabilistically implicated. So what do you end up having is this exchange is capable of developing this probability profile of Alice. Yep, <clears throat> exactly. So we can even expand this. We're going to take this example and sort of do a little bit more with it. So let's say instead of Alice sending four different transactions to an exchange, she takes even less precaution and decides that she just wants to send one 
big transaction here. So this one transaction has four rings. There are four inputs, each with their own rings. And so you see one of these is A, B, C, and D. And then this transaction is deposited on the exchange, again, under Alice's account. Well, now we can be even more clear generally because you have one transaction, like what is the likelihood that a single transaction would contain all of these four outputs that are being watched in each independent ring? It's very, very low. And especially as the number of transactions grow that are, that are tracked to one user, it becomes increasingly unlikely. So this is certain. This is um, certainly a consideration where um, Alice, if she was interacting with an exchange, um, should be concerned about revealing that she is again related to this this one entity, uh, th this address, because it's it's highly unlikely that anyone else could be on uh, this case. It's, it's very likely that this did not happen by chance. Um, the errors are, are very low. Now. Both of these were sort of with one layer of separation where you again have like one person who send funds, who send funds to uh, one intermediary who then sends it onto an exchange. But this could get even more complex. And so I'm gonna show an example now where you have more intermediary steps. Um, in this case, I'm only showing two because that's about what will fit on a slide. Um, and even so it's simplified, but this could be much longer um, depending on what you're really assessing. So again, let's start off with a simple single transaction case. We have Eve here who sends one transaction to this entity. Um, and this output is used, let's, let's say in three transactions. Um, of course, in all likelihood, it would probably be much more, but for the sake of fitting on the slide, let's say three. Um, but let's say none of these transactions were deposited on an exchange or deposited on a service that Eve, Eve is working with to learn more information. Um, let's, so what Eve might do is say, okay, well, even though I didn't learn anything specifically from these set of transactions, I'm still going to watch these new outputs that are generated. So instead of watching these three, I mean, I'm, I'm still going to watch these three, but let's say I'm also going to watch these. Well, now each of these outputs independently has a set of, let's again say three tra other transactions where these are spent. So let's say this output was used in these transactions, this output was used in these transactions and so on and so forth. Let's say in this second layer that there is one transaction here that deposited funds to the exchange. Let's say Eve, um, the, who the exchange knows that Eve deposited these, these funds on the exchange. Well, do they know, or sorry, knows as Alice deposited funds on the exchange. Sorry if I misspoke there. Let's say that, uh, so what do Eve and the exchange really know? How good is their test of determining whether or not Alice is really the same person at, that controls, is, is really the person that controls this account? And this is similar to the very first situation we went over, except that in this case, there is more ambiguity. You're really, you have even less certainty because now instead of saying, okay, well, there's maybe like three transactions that I'm, I'm worried about. Well, there's a lot more transactions here that you're worried about. The graph gets a lot larger, but, um, but Eve can try and learn more information by sending more transactions. So let's say that Eve sends transaction B uh, sends another transaction with output B. This again, doesn't come with any initial red flags in the first transactions that immediately use B. But let's say um, that in the second set of transactions that there was another deposit to the exchange and Alice also made this deposit. Well, now the exchange and Eve start to get a little bit more information about who actually deposited these funds because now you're starting to have enough strength in a statistical model to say, well, now it's unlikely that Alice would have deposited both sources of these funds if they did not receive outputs A and B. So it's really important to show how this grows over time and gets more complicated as you have more layers to this. And to sort of simplify it, I have a, a nice stupid example here um, where we have a transaction tree <laughs> and it 
purposely looks very much like a pyramid here. But um, let's say that like one user, um, like so for each tree here, this is the depth as, as of, of an output as it goes on. So you have your initial transaction here that generates outputs, that generate more outputs, so on and so forth. And this tree gets bigger and bigger over time. So if you have two people uh, that, that are involved on both sides of the transaction, again, let's say you have Eve here, sends funds to Alice, who then sends funds to an exchange really early on, well, there's not a very deep transaction graph. And so Eve and the exchange have a, at least a decent idea. They, they, they can do a statistical test that has a pretty high degree of probability. But if there's only one test that's all the way down here, there's a ton of other entropy that could, could occur. The statistical test is far weaker. But if a user does this twice, so that sure, it might be deep down in the transaction trees, but there are several trees that they can collect information from, well, then the test starts to become stronger again. So ultimately, in summary, and this can be applied to really any sort of application of these statistical tests, the more points of information that the user has, so the more trees that Eve, uh, the exchange, or any sort of observer is able to construct, and the further up the, uh, the tree that the outputs are, or ornaments maybe in this picture example, right? the better the statistical test. So as users have, uh, as you have more instances of information about a user, and as there's less ambiguity for those sets of information, the statistical tests get stronger. And so now you sort of at least should understand the very basics about what an EAE or a poison output set of attacks are. It's the case where users try to construct as many, uh, they try to be associated with as many of these trees as possible and to try and learn as much observable information from it as possible so that they can really get actionable information. And one with is, that, I am done ranting. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say one quick thing, actually. If uh, Oh, I guess we're not going to be able to go back to the diagram while I'm talking. So um, one interesting thing is that, uh, as Justin says, if you go to the bottom of the tree, right, um, the intuition is that you're going to be um, more likely to uh, uh, be hidden by obscurity, right? Security by obscurity as you get down lower to the tree because you have more hops as you go down into the tree. You have more and more options. Um, but one of the interesting things about these trees is that if you go really, really deep, they get scraggly and unhealthy and they don't have a nice full base like a good tree does. Um, and so they get less dense as you go further down. So even though it seems like the further deep you go, the safer you are, if you go too deep, you may also be uh, creating problems for yourself. Um, and that's just one of these interesting properties of these tree structures. I just wanted to throw that out there. All right. Thanks. Thanks, sir. So Sarang, can you talk a little bit about um, something about like how these attacks sort of get harder? What, what you, what, some of the implications are in a little bit more detail about like how these the statistical probabilities for these tests sort of gets um or is determined um right well i mean so they're determined by a few different things right so you kind of talked about two different aspects you talked about the number of trees which of course um, in part, that just kind of depends on how the adversary Eve is doing controlled purchases that may be out of your control, depending on your circumstances. But one parameter that we do, in fact, control that we talked about pretty frequently is ring size. Ring size, of course, is, you know, the number of different outputs that you're kind of throwing around in each ring, which affects in some ways the level of plausible deniability you have that you're the spender of a particular transaction. So in that particular circumstance, um, the idea of the idea of kind of working your way down this tree um, and changing the ring size can in some ways almost kind of affect the width of these different trees. So in particular, every single time that you know you kind of go one layer deep on the tree, a bigger ring size will in general, kind of depending on transaction volume and things like that, um, affect you know, kind of how wide the tree is and therefore kind of how many different paths there are that could lead an adversary toward you know, the, the statistical model of what's going on. So all of the things being equal, um, an increase in the ring size can, in fact, you know, make this a bit harder for the adversary, depending on how it's done. And of course, you know, the number of times that you, um, you know, send funds to another entity, and of course, the idea of what's called churn is just sending the funds to yourself, 
basically brings you kind of deeper and deeper down into this tree, um, which of course may lead you to believe, well, okay, in that case, why don't I just send funds to myself a bunch of different times before I eventually go to the exchange, you know, that I'm far enough down the tree and we said that that's good. But of course, the way that you actually go about doing those transactions, you know, the, the timing that you use, for example, you know, that could also in effect leak information if it's not done safely. So, you know, timing data, you know, that may be available to others looking at the chain or to your ISP, you know, who knows when you're online and things like that. Different types of metadata like that can affect the way that churn is done, you know, which is why when people say, you know, how often should I churn and how should I do it? It's kind of a tricky question because it depends a lot on your threat model and how you go about timing it. So those are kind of two interesting parameters that kind of, kind of affect the way that these little trees are structured. So um, what, what about the point where, like, um, suppose, oh, so how do you sort of avoid this, this type of problem, though? But, like, do larger ring sizes alone sort of help with this, where users don't need to care? Or even with large ring sizes, do users need to care? Well, you know, I guess you can kind of take this to an extreme, right? The idea that, you know, the, well, suppose that the ring size kind of got, you know, as big as it could possibly get. That is, suppose that every possible output was a possible decoy. Um, and that every possible output would be used as a possible decoy. Then you kind of run into this, this large anonymity set situation that other, you know, like zero coin or, you know, Zcash type protocols and assets have, which in that circumstance, you know, you're pretty much as, as good as you can get. You know, everything is, is, you know, equally probable as a spender and trying to build this tree would be, you know, absolutely incomprehensible. So to some extent it does become really good, but, you know, it's, Ring size in our particular case is a parameter that does affect things like transaction time and transaction size. So it definitely needs to be balanced against what we believe the possible benefit could be. You know, it's, it's definitely not a, a, not a one size fits all answer for what the ideal ring size should be. Um, it's, it's, it's tough. <laughs> it's tough and tricky. And then we, I, we also want to make clear that the examples that I sh showed were not exhaustive, right? There's a ton of different other nuances or different things we could have thrown in there that would either make the test, uh, would make the statistical tests far more or less accurate in practice. Um, imagine if they start bringing IP address metadata in where they're going to be like, well, these transactions were also sent from this IP or it's, it's going to get far more involved, or what if there's many people making deposits on the exchange, and so therefore there's a ton of different users that have similar behavior, well then it's going to become weaker. And so it's it's certainly, it, it's not just a, a really sort of simple answer we can have here for you based off what how it all works, because users can come up with whatever sort of statistical tests, they can pull on any other outside information in conjunction with this. So it's all fine and good for us to look at the blockchain and be like, oh, well, absent external information, this. But again, that's not really the case. And of course, even in this sort of attack that we described, um, Eve's involvement, the initial person sending the poisoned outputs that they're tracking, that still is sort of like external information by, by itself. So we're still testing an external information parameter. So yeah, that's actually a really good point. One of the main things is that these Eve, that these E characters, exchanges, and Eve, um, the fact that they know that they are sending these transactions to this one suspicious address in the first place, that's not information that hits the blockchain. They just know that that's external. Um, in addition to that, uh, to elaborate on Sarong's point about ring sizes being sort of counterintuitive. And elaborating on your point that um, if you pick your own uh, metric or heuristic, then you're going to draw a different conclusion. You can you can look at a variety of anonymity metrics and apply them to Monero. And what's interesting is that some of them have some counterintuitive results. For example, increasing ring size once it's bigger than like five or six, it seems. Uh, excuse me. Um, I think the threshold is eight or nine, um, gives you these reduced returns uh, according to certain anonymity metrics. Um, but then sometimes if the blockchain, according to other anonymity metrics, the blockchain getting larger alone is enough to um, uh, reduce the anonymity metric. And so like balancing the ring size, the heaviness of the blockchain and all of these properties um, in order to guarantee people you have a negligible probability of um, your transactions being traced it's not really functionally possible um, uh, currently. Um, 
but the, especially because you can draw different conclusions using different metrics. All right, so Rain, do you have any big takeaways for people who are watching this episode? We sort of discussed like what this is and the fact that it's nuanced, but what are the takeaways for people that are just watching? So, I mean, some of the big takeaways, right, are that a lot of this, as with so many other things, really depends on your threat model. Um, you know, like we had said, you know, the, the kind of the many different forms of this attack kind of assume that you have kind of cooperating entities on both sides, right? You know, you have some kind of KYC AML exchange that, you know, knows who you are when you're doing deposits. Um, you know, and you might have another entity on the other side colluding with that exchange who's maybe making controlled purchases. So, you know, if you, if you are concerned about that, you know, part of it has to do with, you know, knowing the entities with whom you're interacting, if possible. Obviously, in some situations in threat models, you may not be able to, you know, have more control over what those entities are and what they're doing. So, you know, basically, if we can reduce the number of E's, like the exchanges and the eaves and whatever kind of word we want to use for those, you know, ideally, the, the, the more we can get rid of those, the better. Um, but again, that's not necessarily always possible. You know, some users in certain circumstances may be able to, you know, they have a lot of choices over how they're doing deposits or from whom they're accepting funds, but others might not. So what about plausible? Can you speak, um, I, guess, I suppose I can give this to Brandon. Can you speak about um, sort of like the idea between plausible deniability? We've already discussed this in previous episodes, but um, with this sort of statistical test, do people still have the plausible deniability provided by ring signatures? And you're muted. Yeah, I sure was. Um, uh, yeah, so the thing is, is um, all right, so going back to what Sarong said a moment ago about a threat model, if your threat model is that your tyrannical nation is going to shoot you if there is a probability of more than 50% that they can link you with this transaction on the Monero blockchain, um, I would say maybe don't use blockchains at all because you're going to be in a similar probability category as if you use Zcash, if you use any other blockchain. You're probably, if your threat model is that you're going to be punished just for probabilistically even using the technology, then it's not really going to help you out. Um, on the other hand, if your threat model is um, one of plausible deniability, like Justin asks, and you are living in a nation with like a rule of law where you would be prosecuted in a court and you could demonstrate there are 10,000 additional transaction histories, none of which include um, uh, my, my, my alleged transactions. Uh, they just pulled this random transaction history out of the space of all transaction histories and they're accusing me of it. If you can make that plausible deniability argument, um, then Monero is fantastic and uh, honestly, if you can't make that argument, then even cash is dangerous, like physical cash. Um, so in terms of plausible deniability, I would always look at cryptocurrency technology as a plausible deniability technology, not as a way of um, hiding your transactions forever. Uh, on a certain level, you know, we're in an arms race with the people who want to learn your financial information. And we're trying to protect you guys as fast as possible, or as much as possible. But like black holes leak information about their contents. Um, the idea that we would be able to divine a blockchain that will protect people forever from the most extreme threat model where a government is going to nab you if you have a 15% chance that you were guilty. Um, then, you know, you, we have a completely different situation on our hands than um, finance. Okay, thanks, Brandon. So, uh, Sarang, last question then. So, is moving past ring signatures still something that is necessary long term, or is it reasonable for us just to make the ring size like 100 or whatever? Um, so, you know, again, like, you know, increasing the ring size such that we have, you know, a, a ton of different path possibilities in this big tree that makes it, you know, very, very improbable that, you know, an adversary who's not doing a ton of controlled purchases would be able to do that. Um, you know, is it possible? Yes. You know, in theory, we can increase the ring size to basically be whatever we want, you know, depending on, you know, how you do the selection of decoys and things like that. Um, but of course, that increases the size of transactions, which has scaling issues. It also increases the verification time of transactions, which has scaling issues. So, you know, to some extent, this is always kind of a balance game about this. Um, to what benefit is it? You know, you probably have to increase the ring size you know, fairly substantially to be able to, you know, get like a negligible probability of this ever being an issue. So that's unfortunate. And of course, 
you know, that's why the research community right now is really big in kind of taking rings out of the picture entirely to go to more complete anonymity sets. You know, something like, like Zcash and the protocols that they are based on, for example, when used correctly, are able to offer, you know, excellent anonymity sets, complete anonymity sets. But of course, we know that that has trade-offs. You know, it has trade-offs in kind of the whole trusted setup aspect. And, you know, Zcash has had issues with that in the past. So, you know, there's, there's always trade-offs to this. You know, whether or not we'll be able to find something, you know, relatively soon that's able to kind of do away with all those trade-offs, you know, that's, that's uncertain. A lot of people are looking into it. And as I've always said, like, I personally look forward to the day when we don't have to deal with these anonymity set problems anymore. So, you know, we can continue trying to iterate as best we can until the entire ecosystem gets there. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Sarang and Surrey, for joining me today for this, this very difficult episode, frankly, on, on poison outputs, EAE attack, NAC attack, whatever you want to call it. There's tons of different names, and there's tons of different circumstances where it could be applied. So um, I think this serves as a good episode for sort of understanding how people should look at how their sort of transaction tree is growing as they use Monero and um, keep that in mind. And beyond that, make sure to uh, make sure to draw comparisons between this episode and other episodes with what other information you're giving an observer to, to look at information about higher sending transactions. All right, that's all from us today. Thanks for watching. Um, take care, everybody. See ya.